If you would open your Bible to Numbers chapter 10, fourth book of your Old Testament, Numbers chapter 10. Why is there a book called Numbers? There's a numbering of the Israelites in the book of Numbers. You mean God cares about numbers? Yeah, a whole, whole lot of stuff in your Bible that are very important that pertains to specific numbers. So in the book of Numbers, chapter 10, we'll go down towards the end. You're almost to chapter 11. Go to verse 33. Numbers 10, verse 33. And just to give you a little idea of what's happening here. This is about the journeys of the children of Israel through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And you find out some a couple interesting things here in this passage. We'll read about that journey. Look at verse 33. We'll read a few verses here. 1033, uh, Numbers chapter 10. Start verse 33. The Bible says, And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. So this is our jumping off point for today. What we'll do is pray, and then I'll give you an idea where we're headed this morning with this passage. All right, so let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for these words, and thank you for all the folks that are here today. We know that you have a message for all of us from your word, and I ask that that goes forth in the manner that you desire. I certainly don't want to be in the way, and I pray that nothing would distract us from hearing from you today. I pray that this message be very, very clear and would be done in the power of your Holy Spirit, and you would do with it as you see fit. And we ask that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted this morning. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, so before I tell you what this passage has to do with the message, when I say the three R's, what comes to mind? You can help me out with this. The three R's. What are the three R's? Hold on a second. I'm a teacher. Reading, that's an R. Writing, that's a W-R. Arithmetic, who's teaching the lesson here? The three R's. Yes, you're, thank you for, I think Ms. Dawn said that. Thank you. That's exactly the response I wanted. But did you know in the day we live in, there's another three R's. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. I won't even go down that path this morning. But whenever I was putting this together, I thought, I'm going to see what the internet says about the three R's. And that's what came up, believe it or not. I want to give you a message about three R's right out of the scripture. It has nothing to do with either one of those, but I thought that we would use that to get us started. If you take a look at verse 35, you'll see the first one. It says, and it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, notice the wording here. This is neat. Rise up. Who? Rise up, Lord. So there's the first or. Uh, first, first or. First R. Rise, or we'll say rising. And then if you look at verse 36, and when it, talking about the, uh, the cloud there, and when it rested, there's a second R, resting. When it rested, he said, here's the third R, return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. So our three R's we will examine this morning are rising, resting, and returning. Now, I think this is neat because the Bible's unlike any other book, amen? And the Bible tells us how we got here, why we are here, where we're going. It contains prophetic material that is always 100% accurate. Now, you know that in this church, we emphasize the importance of the individual words of Scripture. That's important. And I think it's pretty neat how this account that we just read, which took place around 1500 B.C., has three words beginning with the letter R that actually are very important when it comes to things pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Christian life. Think about it. When I say rise, rising, what comes to mind pertaining to Jesus Christ or the Christian life? Help me out. The resurrection. Let me try this next one, see how we do. What about resting? What does resting have to do with Jesus Christ or the Christian life? What would you say? 
Oh, Zane said over here, Sabbath. I'm actually going to mention a little thing about that. Rest, yeah. And there's more to it than that. There's some neat stuff on that. And then the last one's easy. Return, O Lord. Notice verse 36. Return, O Lord. The big event that you and I are looking for as saved people is the return of Jesus Christ in the clouds. Amen. That precedes his return all the way down here to the earth to set up his kingdom. So return, O Lord. So rising, resting, and returning. I think it's neat how those words are used there. Rise up, rest, and return. And we can actually build a message on things pertaining, like I said, things pertaining to Jesus Christ and the Christian life. So let's take a little trip here through some mostly New Testament passages, if you would. Let's go to Matthew 28. Let's look at the first R, rising. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, one of the things that had to happen for you to be saved was Christ had to die for your sins, and he did, and he had to be buried, and he was, and then he also had to rise again. In fact, he predicted that he would rise from the dead. He actually predicted a bunch of details about his death before his death. So take a look at Matthew 28, verse 1. We'll read a few verses here. This is the account of Jesus Christ's resurrection. So he's been crucified already. He's been buried. And here we are the third day. Look at verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Watch well, verse 6. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, remember he predicted that, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him, lo, I have told you. So the account of Jesus Christ's resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is unlike any other human being who ever walked the face of the earth. Now, who do you know that handled every situation in their life in a perfect manner? How you been doing on that? I've failed miserably, and if you're honest, you have too. Do you know anybody? I mean, we all have friends. We all have people that we know. Do you know anybody who always has always handled every situation in their life, dealing with all kinds of different people. They've always handled it perfectly. Do you know anybody like that? I know one person, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else. Who else do you know that never spoke out in a fleshly manner and their tongue was tame 100% of the time? You know anybody like that? My tongue is certainly not tame 100% of the time, and I'm, if you're honest, yours hasn't been either. Oh, I said some things in the past week I wish I could take back. Have you? <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ never spoke a word that could be considered sinful. He never spoke in a manner that was sinful. Never. Who else do you know that would willingly humble themselves before the same people that he made? Humble, not just to the point of serving them, but to the point of death by crucifixion and his death being 100% undeserved. Can we just say it like this? I could say a whole bunch more about this, but nobody compares to the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, in his death, and obviously his resurrection. So who do you know that has the power to raise themselves from the dead? How's Benny Hinn going to do? <laughs> Any of the well-known faith healers, how are they going to do when it comes to after they die? I'm going to tell you. I can, I can tell you a true prophecy because I know my Bible and you do too. Everybody who dies does not raise from the dead under their own power. Now, I said, I got to clarify that. People will raise from the dead. 
And it's the power of Jesus Christ that will enable them to do so. So if we'll get to more on that in a second. But you would be foolish to put your trust in anybody more than you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I have some close friends. I have some close family members. I have a lot of trust in them. But I'd be a fool to trust any of them more than I trust Jesus Christ. You know, my friends and family don't know all the details about the circumstances I'm dealing with. They don't. I could tell them, but they would never understand them like I do. But Jesus Christ understands every circumstance of my life, not just like I do, better than I do. He knows far more about the details of my life than I do and the problems I face. He knows more about them than I do. So knowing more about them than I do, couldn't he take care of helping me with those situations way better than I could or any of my friends or family members? Amen? My point in this saying all these things is, why would you put your trust in anybody else besides Jesus Christ? Not just a matter of salvation, your own salvation, but we're talking about details of everyday life. We would all be fools to take matters into our own hands and trust ourselves or put more trust in a person more than we would trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Casting all your care upon him. How much of your care? First Peter says all of your care upon him because he careth for you. He cares for you more than anybody else. There is nobody. I was at my parents' house yesterday. I had a good time of fellowship with them. I love my parents. My parents love me. They care for me. I'm so thankful for my parents. They can't even come close to caring for me like the Lord Jesus Christ cares for me. He's so much better. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. More on this thing about rising. So there's the account of the resurrection. What's that got to do with Jesus Christ and knowing him personally? Let's make sure we get this. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll read a few verses here at the beginning. 1 Corinthians 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. Take a look at verse 1. The Bible says, everybody there? 1 Corinthians 15, 1, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, what's, what's he declaring? And hey, don't miss this, the gospel. What's the gospel? Well, let's see. The gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. And watch this part. By which also ye are saved. You're saved by the gospel. Well, what is that all about? He says, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, here's the gospel, verse 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that? Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel, folks. Christ died. Notice what he died for. What does it say? For our sins. Whose sins is that? The Apostle Paul wrote that. So it's got to be him, but the word our indicates more than one, right? So who else sins did he die for? Well, the people he wrote to in Corinth. How about who else? How about you sitting in the pew? How about me standing up here? How about the people down the street here? How about Christ died for the sins of everyone? Amen? Amen. Now, notice what else. It says, he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. He only bury people if they're really dead and he really did die and here's what we're talking about this morning and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures if you go on here and that he was seen of Cephas then of the 12 after that he was seen of how many it says above 500 brethren there were over 500 eyewitnesses of Christ rising from the dead there were people that saw him before the crucifixion and then they saw him after he rose from the dead, and they were able to say, same guy, same Jesus Christ. And he did that for everybody in this room. He did that for sinners. He died for your sins, though he never sinned. He paid the price for your sins. So if you're here this morning, and you never heard this before, you need the greatest thing you could ever know, you need to know this. Christ died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again. And here's what he offers. He offers to you forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed. He offers to you eternal life. That means you die, 
You spend eternity in heaven with him, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Folks, only Jesus Christ can provide those things. And all you have to do is believe that he died for your sins, identify as a sinner, knowing he died for your sins, knowing he rose again. And all you got to do is say, Lord, I need you to save me. I know I deserve hell. I know I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe you died for my sins. Would you save me? And according to Romans 10, if you call on Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, knowing he paid for your sins, you know what he'll do? He'll save you. Amen. He always keeps his word. I'm guilty of not keeping my word. And you, you're honest, you would be right with me. I, I would love to tell you, I've always kept my word. That's not true. Jesus Christ always keeps his word. So don't believe me this morning. Believe your Bible. Believe what the Bible says. Believe Jesus Christ. So rising, I'll just ask you, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And keep in mind, he's a personal Savior. Individuals. He saves individuals. You don't have to be a part of a church for him to save you. Amen to that. He saves individuals. If you have trusted him as your Savior, uh, here's a question for you. You trusted him enough to save you. Are you trusting him enough with all the issues that you have in your life? Or are you trying to solve them on your own? We're guilty of that, aren't we? I'll take care of it. Especially us men. We're really bad about this. I can take care of this myself. No. There's things you can't take care of. You need Jesus Christ to take care of. So let him take care of it. The first R, rising, is foundational to be saved. And it's foundational for living the Christian life. We could do an entire message on the resurrection power Jesus Christ provides. In fact, I, I got to go here real quick. Go back to your left. Go to Romans 8. I got to show you this. This is neat. If you know the Lord, here's a great verse to keep in mind concerning the resurrection power that you have as a believer because of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 8, 11. Actually, back up to verse 10. We'll read 10 and 11. Romans 8, 10. And if Christ be in you, this would be to save people, people who called on Jesus Christ to save them. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now watch this next verse. This is a great one to, to put in your pocket. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth where? You know what's going to happen one day? If you were to die knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will rise again because of the power of Jesus Christ. He made that possible. So if you're in Sunday school this morning, we hit just a little bit on the event that we're all looking for. We're looking for Jesus Christ to show up in the clouds and at that moment, when he shows up in the clouds, what's going to happen is the dead in Christ shall rise first. That means people who knew Jesus Christ that died, they'll get out of the grave. They'll meet him in the air. And then it says, we which are alive and remain down here will be caught up together with him in the clouds. Folks, the power of Jesus Christ, is the resurrection power is enough to get everybody in the last 2,000 years that called on Jesus Christ to save them, to get them out of the grave. Amen. And everybody who's alive down here who knows Jesus Christ as Savior, to pull them more than gravity, more powerful than gravity, to pull them from down here up there. Elon Musk, can you top that? <laughs> he can take a rocket up, but can he take thousands and thousands and maybe even millions of people up? Not a chance. He's got this uh, starship that he's working on to take multiple astronauts up, and they keep having problems with it. And he might get 10 people up there one day. Maybe, maybe he does. But he couldn't do what Jesus Christ is going to do. Can't even compare. You notice how men are always trying to be ripoffs of what only Jesus Christ can do? See, we've got just a few miles from here an attempt to go up and ascend. Who's the one that ascended up on high and led captivity captive? That's Jesus Christ. Okay, so we really neat stuff there. We go on and on. Let's go to the second R. We got rising. How about resting? What's resting got to do with the Lord and about me and you? Go to, we're going to go back to the Old Testament for this first one. Got two places to go on resting. Go to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6 and find 
verse 16. Old Testament prophet, right after Isaiah, Jeremiah, and right before Lamentations. Jeremiah 6, go down there to verse 16. 6.16. 6, Jeremiah chapter 6, and look what old Jeremiah says here, verse 16. Actually, he's going to tell us what the Lord said, which is more important. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Watch this. And ye shall find what? Rest, rest for what? Soul. Rest for your souls. That's a... The greatest kind of rest. Rest for your souls. Now watch this. This is sad. But they said, we will not walk therein. What is it that the people of this day did not want to walk in that would give them rest for their souls? Do you see it in that verse? What did Jeremiah tell them to walk in and ask for? The old paths. Where is the good way? It's interesting. You know whose ways have been around the longest? The Lord's ways. His ways are the best ways. Why would anyone ditch the old ways, the Lord's ways, for something new that is untested, untried, and uncertain? But we love new stuff, don't we? Oh, it's new. I got to have it. A lot of times the new is untested, and a lot of times the new is unreliable. Old is oftentimes very reliable. I, I just happen to have a Bible in my hands that's been around quite some time, and it is reliable. And I hope you can say on a personal level, you've tested it out. And there's a lot of new things on the horizon. Oh, this one's better. This one's better. And if you notice the trend here in the last, it's, it's been around since, uh, oh, 1880 or so, but more so in the last, I'd say, 30 years, 40 years, maybe early 80s. Well, we've got, a new, we've got a new translation, and then here's a newer translation, and then here's a newer translation, and here's a newer... When's this stop? Right. Like, when does it stop? And they even name, we have the, the new King James Version, and the new Living Translation, and the new... They like that word new, don't they? New American Standard. Standard of all things. Isn't that something? And folks, stay the old paths. Stay in the old way. What's there? What does it say is there? Notice the verse. You'll find rest for what? For your souls. Now, I know some of you are thinking, I know, especially you folks, and I'm with you. You folks say 50 and under. You're like, old-fashioned is out of date. Now, here's the thing. I know, and you know, that and I've, I've, I've been around 50 years, many of you in here, much longer than that. You know that our culture is constantly changing. Isn't that the truth? The cult culture is constantly changing. And I will confess, I will admit, there are times when we have to adapt concerning the methods we use with the changing culture. I'll give you an example. Brother Bob didn't have the internet with broadcasting our messages 20 years ago. But we do now. And it's nothing wrong with that. Amen? Isn't that a good thing? The culture has shifted to where it's a technological thing. We've adapted. In fact, during COVID, because Brother Bob had set this up prior to that, we actually just kept chugging along, right? It was kind of neat. So did you notice, though, the methodology might change some because I understand the culture changes. But you can't change the message and you can't change the words. You get in trouble when you do that. Don't just throw God's word off to the side. God's word is not like us. The older we become, the worse off we are. You noticing that? And we got some younger folks here you hadn't noticed that yet. Just wait. You'll notice. The older we get, the worse off we are. But there's this thing in science called entropy. And what that means is things continue to wear out over time. They get worse and worse. But something about your Bible, God's words don't wear out. They are always the same because God's words are like God himself. He doesn't change. He's consistent. God doesn't get old, does he? Time does not change who God is. And the longer we, we, we live, the longer things go on, things change, but God's word remains the same. Amen? Aren't you glad you have a constant, you have an unchanging 
Bible. You have an unchanging word of God that needs no updating, needs no changing because God doesn't need to be changed. God doesn't need to be updated. So those old paths, there's something about them. Now go to Matthew 11. Let's put something else together with this. Matthew chapter 11, something on resting. We've got rising and we've got resting. Notice here, every one of these points is pertaining in some way, shape, or form to Jesus Christ. So we've got to connect that. Look at Matthew 11, verse 28. These are great verses here. If you don't know these, get to know these verses. Matthew 11, 28. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. These are words of Jesus Christ. He says, come unto me. What's the word after me? Who's that include? Everybody. All means all. And that's all, all means. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Now listen, some of you probably saw me this morning like Rockwell's tired. And you're right. I'm looking at y'all and I'm saying some of y'all are really tired. You know why you're tired? You've been working. It says there, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Sometimes the bags of your eyes show that you are heavy laden. Amen to that? That's just the truth. Everybody in here at some time or another, and maybe even on Sunday morning, you, are, you have labored and you are heavy laden. But look at the rest of the verse. Jesus talking here. He says, and I will give you what? Oh, boy. Resting. Jesus Christ gives you the greatest kind of rest you could ever have. Look at verse 29. Look what he says here about this rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. Now watch this part. You shall find rest unto what? Now I mentioned that the old paths are where you find rest. And this Bible that I have has, th this is the Bible that told me about Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is a figure that lived a long time ago. Amen. So he, wa he walked in the old paths. Amen. And it says there that in Jesus Christ, in those old paths and in Jesus Christ, you shall find rest under your what? You know what needs rest more than anything? Any part of you? You think your body needs rest. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You know what else needs rest? Your soul needs rest. You know why your soul needs rest? Because spiritually, your soul is a mess, is a disaster if you don't know Jesus Christ. Your soul is weary. Your soul is constantly laboring. Your soul is just a disaster. Give yourself, give your life to Jesus Christ, and he will give you rest for your soul. Look what verse 30 says. Uh, 30 says, for my yoke, that's Jesus' yoke, my yoke is easy and my burden is what? How is it that his burden is light? If you take Jesus Christ's yoke upon you, it says, take my yoke upon you, it's easy, and my burden is light. Well, somebody has to be carrying your burden. And who would that be? If you're going to take Jesus Christ's yoke upon you, he's carrying the load, amen? He carries it instead of you. Wouldn't you rather him carry it? Can't he take better care of it than you? Why, why are you still carrying it then? Give it up. Give it to him. He'll carry it. He'll take care of you while he carries your burden and your load. If you keep carrying your load, you're going to just get more tired and weary. And you're, you know what you're eventually going to want to do? You're going to want to just give up. You say, I quit. I quit this Christian thing. I just quit everything. You just want to just stop. You, sometimes the Lord brings to a place where we know we can't do anything to fix our problems. And when you get there, you realize only Jesus Christ can fix my problems. And he's just standing there waiting. What's he say in verse 28? Come unto me. He's waiting for you to say, Lord, take all my burdens. I can't carry them anymore, but I know you can. The Lord will take them. True spiritual rest comes from Jesus Christ. If you want to try to carry around all your burdens, you can try. But all they're going to do is get heavier and heavier. Notice verse 29. He says, take my yoke upon you. And then he says this. Don't miss this. And next three words. Learn of me. If you learn of Jesus Christ, that's how you get real spiritual rest. Learn of Jesus Christ and lean on him for every need that you have. Uh, Y'all remember the song? You, you probably all heard it. Lean on me. Lean on me when you're not strong. Lean on who? 
Usually we're talking about a friend when we say that. I'll, I, there's, there's a mention of friends in that song. I can't remember all the words right now, which is probably a good thing. But lean on me. No, why not lean on Jesus Christ? Lean on the Lord Jesus Christ when you're not strong. He'll carry you. He'll always carry you. So uh, I'll give you a little story here. There was a man that challenged another man to an all-day wood chopping contest. Who can chop the most wood in a day? So the one man worked very hard, stopping only for a very short lunch break. He's chopping away. Short little oh, 15, 20-minute lunch. The other guy, he took about an hour for lunch, and he had several breaks during the day. And at the end of the day, the man who took the really short lunch and worked all day was surprised and also annoyed to find that the other guy had chopped substantially more wood, even though he'd taken all these breaks. So here's what he said. He goes, I don't get it. Every time I checked, you were resting while I was chopping wood. So the winning woodsman said this. He said, well, you didn't notice that when I was not chopping, I was sharpening my ax when I sat down to rest. Folks, you can't just work work, work, and do more work, even spiritual work. God, even in the first seven days of history, on the seventh day, what did God do? Now you say, well, what, did the Lord get tired? No, no, no. Here's what the Lord did. He set a precedent for you and I today. Now, you're not a Jew in the Old Testament. You don't have to keep the Sabbath, but it is a good idea for you to get rest at least one day out of seven. And I'll tell you this. I think the one out of seven is the biblical way and the right way. What have we done in our country? We get two out of seven. And then when you show up on Monday morning, everybody's no good and they're tired. I think there's something to that. Six days on, one day off. Now here's the flip side. I'm guilty of this. Many of you in here are guilty of the same. We go like 74 days on. Oh, let's get a day off. That does not work. That does, maybe you go 12, 13 days. And get a day. That does not work either. You need to rest. Now, here's what you want to do when you rest. You know what you want to do when you rest? You want to sharpen your sword. Take the time when you rest to get in God's word and sharpen your sword. So that when you're out there laboring, you're ready to do the work that God needs you to do. So the rest is for your physical body. Amen. And also take some time to sharpen this spiritual sword, the, the word of God that you have here. Take the time... You might want to do this. On that day that you take to rest, carve out an hour. Okay, can't do an hour. Carve out 30 minutes just to get with the Lord and read his word and study it. Sharpen the sword. See, this, this Bible in the hand of somebody who doesn't know how to use it isn't really any good, is it? You got to know how to use the sword. So take the time to get the rest you need, and there's a really good good time you should take to sharpen your sword when you do that. You know, when people die, uh, the, the statement is rest in peace. Make sure that you get some rest before you die. Oh, make sure you get some peaceful rest before you die. You know who gives you real peace and rest while you're alive? The Lord Jesus Christ. It shouldn't take death for you to have to rest in peace. The greatest thing is to be able to lay your head down at night and know, number one, man, I'm tired because I worked hard today. That's good. But even better than that is to lay your head down and say, if I died in my sleep, I know where I'll be. A lot of folks can't do that. They wonder. And that's a, that's a great reason to be worried. If you don't know, yeah, you should be concerned. But the Bible says you can know. You can know without a doubt. First John 5, you can know for certain that if you've called on Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you know you have eternal life, you will pass from death to life if you're saved. Uh, there's a man that I, uh, my first college baseball coach, I had two guys I played for in college, and I got word uh, just yesterday that Friday night, unexpectedly, and he was an older man, but still unexpectedly, passed away in his sleep. And at that moment, the only thing that matters when anybody dies is did you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? And the man that I know, he's in many ways a great man and did a lot of neat things in his life. But all that really matters, 
All that matters for anybody who dies is, did you know Jesus Christ is Savior? By the way, you're leaving everything behind when you die, aren't you? All the, quote, great things that a person did, you're leaving it all here. What goes with you in eternity? Your salvation. That goes with you. All the money you, you had, somebody else is going to spend it. You're not taking that with you. So why invest in earthly, worldly things? Invest in the spiritual now. Make sure you know where you're going to go when you die. Make sure you're living your life for Jesus Christ. And here's why. Let's get to this last point. Returning. Returning. Go back in your uh, New Testament here. 1 Thessalonians 4. And we're already in your New Testament. Go to the right a whole bunch. 1 Thessalonians 4. We'll end up here. We've got rising. Yeah, Christ rose from the dead. He makes it possible for you to rise one day. We've got resting. Make sure you take time to rest. The Lord Jesus Christ should be your source of rest. And now returning this last, ver this last point here, verse, uh, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, go down to verse 18. I'm sorry, go down there to verse 11. We've got to read a little bit here. Let me try the third time. How about verse 13? Let me try that one. 413, third time's a charm. 1 first, uh, first Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Let's take a look here. Returning. Who's returning? Let's take a look. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That would be people who died, who knew Jesus Christ, those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? He's returning in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Watch this part. And so shall we ever be with who? The Lord. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Isn't it a comfort to know Jesus Christ? Isn't it a comfort to know that you're going to fly one day? Amen. I'll fly away. That's a hymn about the rapture. And you'll meet Jesus Christ in the air if you know him as your Savior. I want you to notice something. I mentioned this earlier, but let's uh, repetition is always good. Notice verse 16. Look at the... The last seven words of verse 16, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's folks who died, that knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're no longer with us. Their bodies have been put in a grave. They've been buried. But if they knew Jesus Christ, they will rise again. Right now, they are resting. You know that? They will rise again when he returns. And then notice the first seven words of verse 17. It says, then we which are alive and remain. So if it happened today, Jesus Christ shows up in the clouds, and all of us here are still alive. When that happens today, we would meet Jesus Christ in the clouds if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You'll meet him in the clouds. So we which are alive and remain. What a day that's going to be, amen? Amen. What a day when he shows up. The saved will rise and will forever have rest when Jesus Christ returns. There's a lot more I could say about the return, but I want to try to wrap things up here. I'll just ask you a couple of questions here. If Jesus Christ showed up in the clouds today, would you meet him? Or would you be left? Because if you're left... Things are going to get really, really, really bad down here on earth. If you're here in Sunday school, the Bible says it's the worst time ever on earth. Worse than Hiroshima, worse than World War II, worse than the, the flood of Noah's day. Nothing will compare to the time of great tribulation that will take place after the church is taken out. All saved people are taken out to meet Jesus Christ in the air. It's the worst. Hey, you can know today that you won't be around for that time. During that time, 2 Thessalonians 2 says there will be strong delusion. People will believe lies. You're seeing a little bit of that today, right? It's going to be a whole lot worse in the tribulation. People will believe lies. When you believe a lie, you are deceived. And when you're deceived, you end up dying in your sins. 
That's the worst thing that could happen. It doesn't have to be that way. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ today? Okay, now, if you do, I'll just ask you this question. Are you really, really ready for him to return? I work with younger people during the week, and many a time they have asked me, uh, Ms. Rockwell, um, I kind of don't want the rapture to happen for a while. I want to live my life. I understand. But isn't being with Jesus Christ far better than any highlight you could ever have down here on earth? And see, it's a really, it really tells where you're at spiritually if you're wanting things down here more than things up there. It's a real good spiritual indicator. Now, uh, if you know the Lord, here's another thing to consider. Sometime after the rapture, could be immediately and maybe there's a little time that passes. I'm not for certain. But sometime after the rapture is this event called the judgment seat of Christ. And everybody who knows Jesus Christ as Savior is going to be judged. It's not for heaven or hell. It's a matter of will you be rewarded by the Lord or not? Are you ready to stand before the Lord right now and give an account? The Lord's given you abilities and gifts. What have you done with them? Have you just thrown them away or have you used them for him? You know, a lot of people have abilities and gifts from the Lord that they use for worldly means. Make sure whatever God's given you to use, you use it for him and for his glory because he'll reward you one day. Now, last thing here, go to Revelation 14. We'll wrap up here. Revelation 14. I mentioned this, but I want to give you the verses on this. Revelation 14, verse 9. Here's what's to come in the tribulation. Anybody who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ goes through this time. Look at verse 9, 14, 9. Things are coming that are not good in the tribulation. 14, 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in, the, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have, watch it, they have no what? They have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Folks, it would be a travesty for you to sit here today and go through that time of tribulation and have all this around you. The only way to escape what's coming is to call on Jesus Christ to be your Savior. It's the only way. What's keeping you from doing that today if you don't know him? What's hindering you? Whatever it is, it's not important enough. It's not. This is the most important thing you could ever do. Call on Jesus Christ. Trust him to be your Savior. Look at verse 12 there. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now watch verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may what? Rest from their labors and their works do follow them. The world is in search of rest and it's only found in Jesus Christ. Because he rose from the dead, he provides you with the rest that you need, the spiritual rest you need, and he will return for you. Amen? Amen? What promises we have from God? We'll have a time here in a moment of invitation. And whatever the need may be, whether you, you know, don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, let's get that settled today. And we don't have to rush into that. We can take time after church to talk to you. Uh, also, if, if you're here today and you're carrying around burdens, why are you still carrying them around? Drop them. Actually, better than that, Lord, you take them, and he'll actually carry them, and it won't be heavy for you. He'll take care of them. He, by the way, he can take my burdens. He can take Sherry's burdens, Zane's burdens, Fred's burdens, Pastor. He can take everybody's in here, everybody, and he can carry them. He's that strong, amen? amen. Stop carrying them. Unload them. Let the Lord take them. And you know what you'll have? You'll have rest. You won't be all stressed out and anxious and worried. You'll have rest. So let's pray together, and then we'll have time of invitation. Thank you, Lord, for your words. We are always so thankful to be able to get great spiritual insight and encouragement from your words. I pray that folks here today would respond to the invitation time, respond to you 
during this invitation time in a way that you would most be pleased with. And help, help us not to postpone a decision for you, but to take care of that today. And we ask this in 